You're listening to The Continuing Adventures of Billy Barbarian, written and read by J.R. Murdoch. For more information, please visit ofgnomesanddwarves.com or jrmurdoch.com. Even fat paced. Billy grew tired of watching and started repeating himself. At least fat didn't berate him for talking, just for asking questions. Jack, on the other hand, had taken to carving his name into the wall with a dagger. Billy removed his pack and dug out a jar of pickles. If you open here, I kick you! Billy stood up to his full height and looked down at fat. He'd only known him for a short time, but was pretty sure fat couldn't kick high enough to do any damage. He stood up, holding the jar in both hands ready to open it. I warn you, don't! Billy turned the lid of the jar. Jack gasped. Fat leapt into the air and screamed, his foot out in front of him. Billy dropped the pickle jar and caught Fat. Fat grasped the sides of Billy's head and smashed him in the face with his forehead. White stars danced about his vision and he dropped Fat to the ground. He didn't see Fat land, but he heard him curse and slip in the pickle juice. It took several seconds for his vision to clear. Jack just laughed. The doors to Celine's dressing room slammed open. What the hell is going on here? Celine demanded. All three froze. Billy pointed at Fat, who reeked of pickle juice. Celine's eyes narrowed to tiny slits, and her right eye twitched slightly. Despite her obvious anger, she still looked beautiful in her costume, a tight-fitting black ensemble that showed a generous portion of midriff and didn't leave any of her curves to the imagination. Fat stammered, but Celine cut him off with a hand. I don't want to hear about it. The three of you will stay down here. I don't want you on stage. No, Fat shouted and straightened himself. Your protection is our job, and we must be on stage while you perform. Fine. If you must be there, you'll be as far back of the stage as you can. I don't want to see or smell you. I don't care what your job is. But we get threat, Fat started to say, but Selene turned and ascended the stairs, not even acknowledging he had said anything. Several assistants, makeup artists, and costume holders followed. Is she going to sing now? Fat repeated Celine's performance and went up the stairs, not addressing Billy's question. No, Billy. She's got to make sure everything is right before she starts to sing. There's still sound checks to do, making sure all of her people are on the right spot for costume changes, things like that. This is a big deal, this concert. Why doesn't she just get up there and sing? It's entertainment. People want something different. When you see the show, it'll make sense. Come on, let's get up there. You're not high on Fat's list right now. What list? Just come on. Billy wanted to ask another question, but even Jack seemed to be tiring. He had so much to learn about this world, and his mother had always said, the only stupid person is the one who asks no questions, for no one knows everything. Billy wanted to be as smart as he could be, and the only way he could was to ask questions and find things out. He'd learned so much since arriving into Sethopolis. He didn't want to stop now. On the stage and behind the curtain, Celine swept and danced gracefully with an accompaniment of backup dancers. She pointed and made demands and had certain things rearranged. A few torches were moved, and Steve Jameson, the general stage manager, protested some of her demands, saying that her changes would affect the pyrotechnic displays. She acquiesced on some of her demands, but others she was adamant about. After several long minutes, she finished and strode over to the three guards. The three of you need to go back there, behind the band. You can see me, but I won't be able to see you. Fat crossed his arms. No, we need stay in plain sight. We are paid to be seen, not hide in corner. I don't care what you're paid for. Miss, Billy said and leaned down to talk to her. I really think we should be close by, just in case. We heard you might be in danger. Jack and Fat both elbowed Billy. What did you say? Danger? He don't know what he say. We just here as precaution. Celine looked deep into Billy's eyes. You were going to say danger, weren't you? Billy nodded dumbly. What sort of danger? Billy shrugged. So if you don't know what type of danger, how can you protect me from it? Fat interceded. We will be seen and keep watch. We protect you. Fine, but do it stage right. I don't want you getting in my way during costume changes or when I need to go on and off stage. Is that understood? And wash that horrible pickle smell. Celine walked away. Come! Fat walked to the opposite side of the stage, out of the way. 
Billy hung his head. He'd rather be nearer Celine. She smelled so pretty, like fresh pulled flowers with a flowery, earthy smell. Intoxicating. Even though she lived in the big city and so far away from their homeland, she reminded him of home. Everything here was so different. Nothing was what he expected it to be. Some he liked, some he didn't, but all different. Celine provided at least one small grasp to the life he'd left behind, even if she'd left the same life behind. He wanted to spend time with her, talk to her, ask her questions, get to know her and about her life. She just wanted him to stand as far away as possible. Billy, I say, stand there. Fat pointed to a spot several feet away from him. Sure, now even Fat wanted him to stand further away. Why didn't he just go home? He stuck his hand into his pocket. He felt the card that Stump had given him. At least one person wanted him around. He would definitely have to look Ronald Stump up after this job. He also felt the hard stone card, and Phil Smith, too. Phil wanted Billy around, if nothing else for company. Billy resolved himself to do the job of protecting Celine to the best of his ability. Nothing would get by him. With his barbarian background, he'd be able to sniff out any danger. He'd be able to see any threat coming. His skills were those honed in the wilds of the north. He could spot a deer at 500 paces and shoot it down at 200. Spying an attack in a crowd of people would be akin to spying a buck in tall grass. You'd just have to wait and watch for the right movement. The spot where Billy stood wasn't a bad spot at all. Even though part of his view would be blocked by the curtain, Fat and Jack stood nearer the curtain and wouldn't be able to see much of the crowd at all, if any. At least Billy would have a clear shot to see a good majority, even high into the seats toward the top of the stadium. With the quality of lighting, he'd be able to see just fine. The torches and fireballs dimmed drastically. The darkness scared Billy for an instant until his eyes adjusted. Musicians appeared from the rear of the stage and took up positions to drums or held string instruments and horns. Celine and her dancers took up poses in the center of the stage. The drums started first, followed by a building of horns and strings. The crowd noise swelled and receded. Billy looked at everything, trying to take it all in. The dancers didn't move. Not until the curtain disappeared straight up and into the overhead. Billy looked up and noticed several people dressed in black scurry in the stage rigging. Two explosions flashed and lit up the stage. Billy's eyes widened. Were they under attack? Could someone have been waiting for the curtain to rise? Cheers and applause exploded from the crowd as well, and Celine spun and danced to the edge of the stage. Billy lurched forward, but stopped when he noticed Fat and Jack were not moving, and only watching. This must be the show. The concert. How could people like something that started so frightening? Gradually the music wound down to more melodic tones, and Celine sang. Her voice as sweet as fresh honey and magically amplified to be heard throughout the stadium. For several long moments he found himself lost in her song. The realization that people dressed in black, moved about in the stage rigging, pulled him back. He looked around and ran for the near support and climbed. At the top, he had a hard time navigating the narrow catwalks, with his bulky pack, sword, and axe in the way. At once he caught one of the men in black. The man flailed about. What are you doing up here? I want to ask you the same thing. No one should be up here. We're here to help with the show. Billy pulled the man closer. What? We take care of the curtain and some of the spot torches. Let me go. I've got to get into position. I don't understand. The man fought free of Billy's grasp. This entire show is choreographed. I'm here to make sure that some things look right when they're dancing and singing. The man ran past Billy. He stood there, looking and feeling stupid. So they were wearing black, so they wouldn't be noticed. That made sense. They'd be able to make sure all the focus remained on Celine and not on what was going on in the background. His pocket vibrated and rang. The orb. He pulled it out of his pocket. Yes? Why are you not in position? Billy looked up and into the crowd. He was supposed to be paying attention. He should be watching the crowd for an attack on Celine. He shoved the orb back in his pocket. He had an amazing view from the top of the stage. He could see everything. Even with the dimmed firelight from the crowd, all lay before him. A glint from a tower in the middle of the crowd caught his eye. Someone, a dark figure, made its way up the center tower. At first Billy assumed it must be another person working to make the concert look good, but the person stopped. Billy saw the crossbow. His eyes widened. Yes, he saw a crossbow in the person's hand. He had to act. He had to act quickly.
Time froze for Billy. Being in the rigging and on this catwalk, he had no time to scramble back down, and he wouldn't be able to contact Fat and Jack in time for them to react. It would take too much explanation. The man with a crossbow lay on his stomach and took aim. He definitely aimed for Celine. Billy could see her dancing and spinning below. A rope caught his eye. Without thinking, Billy climbed outside the rails of the catwalk and reached for the rope. He had to time her dancing moves just right. He looked and caught sight of the assassin. The man stood and waited. He had to be waiting for her to stop moving before he fired. Billy didn't have the luxury. He had to move now. He jumped for the rope. The dancers stopped moving. The bolt burst into flames as it sprang from the crossbow. Celine stopped dancing and raised her hands in the air as the band ended in a crescendo. Two blasts rose from either side of the stage. Billy caught the rope, and his massive bulk tore it free, and he swung down to the stage. At first he plummeted straight down, the rope firmly grasped in one hand. He gritted his teeth as he sped downward faster and faster until the rope caught, and he began to arc from the right side of the stage toward the left. One of the dancers screamed. Celine looked at Billy in his swing. She snarled. Billy saw the arrow fire. He had to get there in time. He just had to. Billy's aim proved to be off as he came more from the rear of the stage and he plowed into two dancers and finally landed in front of Celine. He stood up in front of her and saw her glare. He felt something impact into his pack. He turned to see what it was. He didn't see anything and kept turning. Celine stopped him. The crowd cheered. Billy turned away from Celine, smiled and waved. He shielded his eyes and looked for the assassin, but the man had disappeared. At least his attempt had been foiled. Jack tossed a bucket of water onto Billy. You're on fire! Get off the stage! Celine yelled at him. Her voice wasn't amplified, so only they heard her. Jack dragged Billy to the side of the stage. What got into you? That was the stupidest thing I've ever seen! Someone tried to shoot her! Billy tried to point at his pack. Jack spun him around and pulled out the arrow. How do you know this wasn't part of the show? The man aimed it at Celine. If I hadn't got down there in time, she would have been killed. The man took off. We need to go find him. Billy started to run, but Jack stopped him. Billy, our job is here, not out there. Someone tried to kill Miss Celine. We need to go. We need to. Maybe we can stop them before they try again. Did you get a look at this person? Well, no, but I know we can catch him. Jack lowered his head and shook it disapprovingly. Billy, we can't. We need to stay here. Billy craned his head around and tried to see if he could spot the person. People swayed to the music, a softer melody, with more singing and less dancing. Billy scanned and waited. He knew he could find the person. He just knew it. He couldn't let him get away. Billy, are you listening to me? I tell you no good idea. You no listen. I see him. Billy launched himself away from Jack and off the side of the stage. Billy saw a person holding a crossbow pushing through the crowd to an exit. If he managed it right, he could cut the person off and have no trouble catching him. The man saw Billy and double-backed into the crowd. Billy had an open shot to the exit, but now he needed to follow the man into the crowd. He didn't want to disturb people. Billy, what are you doing? I saw him. I'm going to catch him. No, we need to get back on the stage. No, we need to catch this person before he tries again. Billy, come on. No, Jack, I'm going to catch this person. Billy pushed his way into the crowd and Jack followed. With his height advantage, Billy easily saw the course the man took and followed, slowed only by the sheer quantity of people crammed onto the floor. Some complained about Billy's interruption, but most just moved as quickly as they could to get out of the speeding barbarian's way. He paused for only a minute when he passed the stage. He stood perhaps fifteen or twenty rows back, and Celine stood center stage, with two torch spots illuminating her. He wanted to just stand and watch, but Jack pushed him. If you're going to catch this guy, then let's hurry up and do it. Move, move, move. Billy shook his head and turned back to regain his bearings. Once again, he pushed and weaved his way through the crowd. Only once did he have to yell for someone to clear the way. The man in black made it to the exit corridor only slightly ahead of Billy. The corridor was long and for the most part empty. When Billy burst free of the crowd, he sighted the man immediately. Being that he stood in the middle of the corridor, raising the crossbow made it really easy. The man loosed the bolt and Billy spun around. It impacted into his pack. When Billy turned back, the man had already started to run up the corridor. Billy took chase again. He wouldn't be stopped. Not when he was so close. He would catch the man that tried to kill Celine. Billy, slow up! I can't! 
The chase led to a stairwell. Billy didn't let that slow him down. Tripping on the first step, however, did. Jack caught up by the time Billy righted himself and shot up the stairs. Billy was used to running. He could do it all day. Jack, he knew, wouldn't be able to. He'd have to end this chase quickly. The stairs wound around and around and finally ended at street level. Billy saw the man running through a group of people toward the street. Billy pushed off the wooden handrail and followed. Much to Billy's surprise, the man waited. He stood with a smile on his face. Now Billy could see him. His beady eyes, his thin mustache, his black hair under his black hood. But why did he just stand there? Billy didn't slow. He would catch the man. The man didn't stay standing. He pulled another man, one holding little flags with Celine's image on them, and little Celine dolls and hollow sticks that could be banged together, also with Celine's name upon them. The man in black pulled this innocent man into Billy's path and stepped aside. Billy, running at full speed, smashed into the poor bystander. Both fell to the ground, a tangle of arms, legs, and trinkets. The man in black laughed and ran out of the stadium. Jack caught up with Billy. He puffed and panted and stopped and put his hands on his knees. Billy, we need to go back. Billy, barely breathing hard, untangled himself and stood. Not when we're so close, Jack. We need to catch him. Jack righted himself slightly and pulled his orb from his pocket. That said we need to go back and now. Billy looked at Jack, then at the exit. He looked back and forth several times. No, Jack. That man tried to kill Celine. We need to catch him. Billy turned and ran after the man in black. Jack, still trying to catch his breath, followed. Jack had answered, but hung up. Billy was ignoring the buzzing orb. Fat answered. Where are they now? Iman asked, his rage rising higher and higher, but his voice not giving away his current temperament. They leave. You want I go look? No. Stay there. I don't know what they're thinking. Billy say someone try kill Celine. What? That wasn't possible. He hadn't authorized another assassin. That wasn't part of the plan. Someone must know the plan. No, that couldn't be. He'd not even told Fat or Jack the full extent of the plan. No one knew. Only he knew. He had to think of a way to get Billy and Jack, most importantly Billy, back onto the stage. Iman looked at the few guests in his stadium box who sat enamored by the concert and oblivious to him. He cared little for music. If his plan hadn't dictated that he'd be here and listening to this caterwauling, he'd be back at his tower. But so much plotting and planning would not go to waste because of an overzealous barbarian. He'd have to take steps to make sure his plan would go unmolested. Fat. Take a break. What? I don't understand. I want you to take a break. Go find Smith and have a drink or two. After a long pause, Fat responded, I don't think good idea. I didn't ask if it was a good idea. Billy left the stage. It's not so important that you stay there. Please, take a break. I'll let you know when to go back on the stage. And try to get a hold of Jack and Billy. Get them to come back to the stage. Again, another long pause. You sure? Iman's patience had worn thin, but he couldn't let his anger get the best of him. Not now. Not when he was so close. He closed his eyes and took a deep breath. Yes. Please find Smith and have a drink with him. Okay. Iman broke the connection and returned the orb to his pocket. Now he had a contingency in place. If Billy didn't return, he'd be able to use fat. He didn't want to use fat. Fat could be useful later. Still, that didn't matter in the grand scheme. Just another piece of chaff to be cast aside. That's all. Sooner or later he'd have done away with fat. It didn't matter if that time came now. If Billy escaped, he'd have to make sure to avenge Fat. He couldn't just let the barbarian run free without repercussions. If only Billy had stayed put. Iman took a drink of his wine. Sweet and pungent. He hated it. But he needed to put on a good face for his guests. They just like the rest of the people in attendance at this concert, were oblivious to the finale he'd planned. No one would ever forget it. He laughed quietly, repressing the urge to toss his head back and laughed long and hard. Until the concert ended, he'd have to content himself with quiet laughter. It would do. Oh, yes, it would do. 
Billy scanned the street from side to side. He took a tested sniff of the air, but he'd not gotten a good smell of the assassin. But he tried to smell him out anyway. The traffic in the street moved from side to side. Much of the road had been paved, but a spot of dirt still remained and showed the direction of the traffic pattern. Billy spotted a single footprint that ran counter to that traffic. He looked up and saw a cart swerve and a black hood duck into an alley. Without thinking of his own safety, Billy darted into the street after the man. Animals squawked and hollered as did drivers that were forced to swerve their carts to keep from hitting Billy. He made his way across the street and could hear complaints rise from Jack as he trailed from behind. The dark, dank alley smelled of dead fish and feces. The man in black stumbled over piles of trash and offal. Billy drew his sword and continued the chase, trying to keep his eye on the man. He couldn't let him get away with trying to kill Celine. He just couldn't. If they had been in the north, this man would have already been caught. But here in the city, people didn't seem to want to get involved with stopping this fugitive. Billy waited and pushed his way through the knee-deep slop in the alley. He didn't let his legs being mired down slow him. In fact, he pushed hard and started to gain on the man in black. I'll go around! Billy turned his head for only a second to see Jack run down the street. That would be good if Jack could make it around in time. He hadn't proven to be that good of a runner, but the mess in the alley didn't help forward progress. When Billy turned his head back, the man in black had disappeared. He couldn't have gotten out of the alley. It was nearly 200 feet long, and he'd only been halfway down. Billy pushed onward, moving slightly slower. If the man had hid, he'd be able to... Billy's thoughts were rudely interrupted by a board in his face. White stars flashed and blurred his vision. He dropped his sword and swayed. It took several blinks before he saw the man in black speeding down the alley. Billy took a step, but he had to fetch his sword first. He staggered into the wall, righted himself, then continued down the alley. Several times he faltered and nearly fell, but he kept going. A simple thing like a board in the face wasn't going to stop him. Not even the blood that now flowed out of his nose and all over his clothes would stop him. The man in black had reached the end of the alley and looked both ways. When he looked to the right, he hunkered down as if he expected to get hit. Jack flew at the man, but missed, and the man in black ran in the direction Jack had come from. Jack struggled to get to his feet. He put his hands on his knees and took several gasping breaths before he put his feet to give chase after the assassin. Billy exploded out of the alley. As soon as his feet were free, he quickly caught up with Jack. Hurry! He's getting away! Once Jack had been overtaken, Billy started to catch up to the man in black. Billy was used to running. He could run for days if need be. Even though his pack bumped his back, he wasn't going to stop until he had the assassin. The man in black looked over his shoulder. Billy got a good look at his face. Swarthy complexion, slender nose, close-set eyes, and a sharp mustache. Billy burned the image of the man into his mind and pressed harder, his jaw set with determination. The man in black's eyes widened as he ran with renewed fear. Without warning, the man in black ducked inside a building. Billy, only seconds behind, rushed into the store. He froze just inside. Growing up, Billy had gotten used to two things. Buildings contained people, animals, or stored food stuff in them. He'd accepted that the stump tower contained many apartments for people to live in. It was something new, but he could accept it. That building served to house people. The building he'd just stumbled into contained stuff. His mind grasped that quickly enough. What he couldn't wrap his mind around was the immense amount of stuff it contained. He'd seen buildings with large amounts of food. Nothing surprising with the quantity. This building contained more things than Billy had ever seen in his life, and all under one roof. Racks held an assortment of clothing of every hue of color, shelves displaying shoes and boots of all variety. Hats and coats hung from pegs along part of one wall. Even beyond the clothes, chickens balked and clucked. The aroma of fresh-cooked corn hit Billy hard and pangs of hunger tore his stomach. Not now. He didn't want to be distracted, but looking at the clothes, the food, the equipment, the people, people, dozens of people looked at items on racks, tried on clothing, sampled foods. None of them looked like the man in black Billy had been pursuing. Can I help you, sir? Oh. A neatly dressed man, bald, wearing spectacles, with Stephen embroidered on his shirt, took a step back when he saw Billy's sword and the blood covering him. We don't allow weapons to be out when in the store. I'm looking for someone. That doesn't matter. Put your sword away, or I'll be forced to call security. I am the security. I'm protecting Celine. The man, Stephen, squealed. 
Celine Dijon? I thought she was giving a concert. She is. Someone tried to kill her. I chased him in here. He's dressed in all black. I'm sure I would have seen a man dressed in all black. How totally out of fashion. Jack pushed through the doors and hung on Billy's arm, panting heavily. Find him? <laughs> no, but this man says he's not in here. Stephen stood straight. I assure you that I greet everyone that comes into Smith's. This man will be trying not to be noticed. Billy scanned the aisles and racks. If you like, you can come in and look around, but put that sword away. I will call security. I don't care who you're protecting. If that person isn't here, you'll have to browse unarmed. Billy scowled, but sheathed his sword. Come on, Jack. Let's spread out and keep an eye out for a dark-skinned man dressed in black. Dark and in black. <sighs> Got it. Jack went to the left, Billy to the right. Both made sure to look each person in the face as they made their way down their respective aisles. Billy frightened more than one prospective customer with his bloodied face. He apologized in kind and moved on. He stopped when he saw a flowered hat disappear off a shelf, in a hand gloved in black. After a brief pause, he inched toward where the hat had gone and saw a coat vanish off a rack. He tried to take in air through his nose but couldn't breathe. Must be broken. I'll make sure you pay for that. Billy silently crept along the aisle. A hand reached out to grab a shirt from a shelf. Billy's hand moved with lightning quickness and he caught the hand and pulled, knocking down the shelves in the process. The man in black had changed into the flowered hat and held a brown coat. Billy, with one massive fist, knocked the man on the head, effectively knocking him out. He smiled at having caught the man. Hey! The neatly dressed man, Stephen, ran across the store. I caught him. You don't have to... I don't care who you caught. You destroyed half the store. No, I didn't. I just... Who's going to take care of this? Jack rushed over to Billy's side. We're both close. Personal friends of Mr. Smith. Mr. Phil Smith. We'll speak to him when we return to the concert. He is a guest of Mr. Stump and Miss Celine. I'll make sure he contacts you immediately after the concert. What? Jack wasted no time on the confusion and pulled Billy toward the door. Jack, I got him. Good, Billy. Now let's get out of here. You're right. Celine will be so proud we caught this guy. Billy, proud isn't what she's going to be when she sees you again. Are you sure? And say, you said Miss Celine. Is she single? Just hurry up. Everyone is going to be upset that we left the stadium. We've got to get back and get back now. So, was that one of Phil's stores? Billy slung the man in black, with the flowered hat firmly planted on his head, over his shoulder, and followed Jack into the street. Just come on! Thank you for taking the time to listen to The Continuing Adventures of Billy Barbarian. For more information on this book and its author, please visit ofgnomesanddwarves.com or jrmurdoch.com. And again, thank you for listening.